Okay, welcome everybody as we continue kind of our more practical discussion of the technical tools. In this section, uh, we're going to get into actually some, some real world kind of tangible examples of how the lean tools we've discussed in the previous sections can be uh, developed and used. And so these are the ones that we're going to be covering, just taking a, a brief look at. Um, and again, these are just some examples to kind of get everybody um, used to kind of thinking about this and maybe provide a, a starting point. Uh, so the ones we're going to look at is standardized work, some ways to build in quality, uh, schedule and, and problem tracking board, some ideas there, uh, ideas for continuous flow and pull system, um, taking a quick look at some basic kind of rudimentary and on system stuff, and then the last one we'll do um, a review of, of Kanbans and take a look at maybe one or two ways to, to actually apply this. So the first thing we'll look at is standardized work. And again, just as a review, basically what standardized work is, it's just the sequence of production steps um, that are put together based on best practices and repeatability. With the goal being, you know, we want to be able to use our standardized work, and our standardized work, if we follow it, should allow us to produce at the highest quality, at the lowest cost, and in the most effective and safe manner. That's what standardized work lets us do. And then again, just as a, as a footnote, um, for organizations that produce a variety of product with option content, um, you know, in terms of pull system context type B systems, standardized work works for that as well. Um, we use this idea of weighted average times um, to account for that model mix. And again, the key thought is even if there's a lot of volatility or variability, we want to try and understand what we can, standardize what we can, put a number to what we can uh, as a basis to start working from. You know, with the understanding that it will, it's it's never perfect. But we start where we can with the best that we can do and we work to continue to improve it. And so just you know, to wrap it up one more time, what standardized work is, how we want to use it, how we want to communicate it to the team members as its purpose is it's the standard for production time, uh, how long it takes to produce at this work cell, the sequence of elements, how we, how we produce, and then uh, controls and regulates our ability to build in quality. That's really what we want to focus on using it for. And so to take a look, just as an example standardized worksheet, again, everyone will be totally different. So tailor it to the, uh, the best needs of the organization. This is just a sample. Uh, but it includes some basic information that, that um, everyone should be encouraged to make sure they're including. So some form of header bar that uh, just identifies what the process is, you know, what's the previous process, next process, who the operator is, and uh, what the tack time should be there. Uh, then the next thing that's got to be included is some list of the actual work elements that are being done in the sequence they should be being done and then their associated element times so how long each one of those steps should take and the reason that's there is for production planning we talk about rebalance and things like that but also for visual management so the supervisor or a manager or another team member they can all walk by and see at exactly this much time where that team member should be so it provides immediate um, immediate status on site, the header behind. You can see that from the standardized work. Uh, then down at the bottom, uh, you've got kind of your element uh, average time totals, and that's just to see how the total amount of value added work time stacks up to the tack time. That's included here. Uh, everyone's will be a little bit different. Uh, you've also got the total time uh, tracked um, in addition to the individual element times as you go through it. Uh, then this thing on the right is more a visual representation of the standardized work. So it's a time graph. Some can have it, not necessary. Uh, what it's good for is it will show steps that take a disproportionately large amount of time compared to the surrounding steps. So status at a glance, Kaizen at a glance, problem solving at a glance. Uh, we know if we need to eliminate two minutes from this process, we can quickly look at the graph. And if there's a bar there that's you know one and a half times the size of all the ones around it, maybe that's a good place to start because there's a lot of time there. So it's more of a, a visual cue. Uh, there's also possible to strip it all down and just do a simple compact version that only lists work elements in total time. You know, it's, there's, there's lots of options as long as the, the information is present. Uh, then in terms of tools to help build in quality, you know, remember our, our overall goals with that is we don't want to pass defects. We want to make sure we can catch them, find them, see them, and fix them in the process. And the reason that's good is, you know, we're getting immediate quality feedback, so we're not going to build 30 units with defects before someone down the line catches them. And again, those defects are found at the source, so we don't have to rework everything once the defects finally do get caught. 
And uh, just kind of to tie it back to one of the overall kind of philosophical goals is this is really a, uh, a representation and an outcropping of customer first thinking, right? Being able to provide the customer, our internal customers, you know, the customer that's the next process down from me, good product that they expect and don't have to rework themselves, right? Internal customer first thinking. And so one of the, one of the tools uh, to use to do that, that's easy, simple, straightforward, is just a simple quality standard. So at each process, you have a written documented standard for what is acceptable, what's not, you know, normal and abnormal. And that difference then becomes the definition between a good, uh, a good product or a product with a defect. It's objective, it's written, everyone can understand what we're looking for. And then what you want to do too, just to build in some accountability, uh, quality ownership is expressed through some form of, of sign-off sheet that moves with the product or can stay. You know, it, it, it really doesn't matter. The, the key thinking there is just that there is some accountability that someone has confirmed that this, this product did meet that quality standard. And this is just an example of how simple those quality sign-off sheet could be. It doesn't have to be anything formal. It could be a post-it note if it was organized well. But really, it's just something basic that has what the job was. Someone will verify that the quality standard was met. And then any notes that may be of value to management to make things better. It could be as simple as that. That's all we need to help us build in quality. Uh, then the idea of these schedule and problem tracking boards. So we talked about this in the uh, implementation, uh, implementation planning section. This idea of creating the expectation of what team members should be working on when and why. And then as well as for our problem solving, starting to collect daily problems as they come up so we can be responsive in addressing them. Uh, the schedule and problem tracking board is an easy way to kind of combine those and uh, it's a simple straightforward thing that people can become accustomed to working with pretty quickly. And so what they are is they're based on tack time and so it coordinates production between the group. So it's a way to see based around tack time you know, what each individual um, station should be working on based off what the customer demand is. The kind of key thought about how these are set up and why they're based on tack time and how they coordinate production uh, between the groups is that the upstream process schedule is determined by the downstream process requirements. So just like a pull system, even though we're not ready to implement it when we get to these, we set it up by saying what is the, what is the customer need, what products, when and how, and then what's the next process upstream, say it's shipping. Okay, then what does shipping need to be able to get the customer what they want? And then whoever is ahead of shipping, what do they need to get shipping what they want, right? So kind of iteratively, we start at the end with the customer all the way back through the process, uh, making sure that everyone is working on what they need to be working on in order to get the customer what they want. Uh, it's good because we talked a little bit about, too, making sure that we coordinate our material and inventory handling to tack time. This is a great tool that can help with that. Um, and then in terms of management, visual management, it's also a very valuable asset in being able to see a head behind condition at a glance. It's, it's kind of a, a great all-in-one uh, kind of tool. And out of that, stability uh, as the foundation of everything we're doing. These go a long way to help creating that. And this is just kind of an up-close look, uh, again, because just like with standardized work and, and the quality um, the quality manuals, there is some key information that's presented on these and then everything else is open to customization. And so really we need some sort of production sequence so we know what's coming next, what was just coming, what we should be working on. Uh, the time for when we should be working on it so we can create the expectation of how long it should take, tack time again. Um, and then we have the ability to track a head behind condition. So it becomes status at a glance. Are we ahead? Are we behind? What's going on? You know, we can start coordinating and creating the expectation of how we should be working now that we're presenting the information to the people that need it. Then the also thing that's on it is we track our production problems. So whatever problems showed up during the day, it's an open ended way to capture those and it becomes a communication tool back and forth as to what we're doing solving them. And then just like with standardized work, we like to incorporate some sort of uh, visual component just to make it, again, easier status at a glance. Sometimes this is easy, sometimes it works well, maybe others not so great, but again, it's not necessarily critical, but it does help to make things visual, it's easier to see them. So uh, then when we look at continuous flow, you know, how can we actually develop real tools for that? So work processes that are designed around and designed to support continuous flow do a couple things. They eliminate silo building, 
Uh, they eliminate to building into in process stock, right? One by one build, small batch sizes. Uh, they let us build in quality at each process, and the end result is we're building what we need, when we need it, in that right amount. And so again, just like in the previous section, this is kind of what it looks like. You know, before we have continuous flow, we'll find work processes with lots of in-process stock and inventory that gets built in the crews. Uh, with continuous flow, we really want to work to eliminate those silos and eliminate that inventory buildup. And so to manage that one-by-one -one production and to actually get rid of that inventory, uh, we use these ideas. Uh, one of the ideas we can use is something called a pull box. And it's really just a visual indication of condition, normal, abnormal. But what they also do, which is great, is that they prevent overproduction by one unit, which is waste. And eventual overproduction is how we build up that in-process stock and that inventory. So this, the, the ability to prevent overproduction is really how we prevent and eliminate that accrual of inventory and that, that silo mentality. And so, again, just as a quick review, in this example, we set up two pull boxes to hold two units at all times. So if one unit is there, we know we're behind. If two units are there, we know we're in good condition. And if more than two units are there, we know that we're overproducing. There's waste. Management can immediately shut idle the line upstream until we fix the bottleneck downstream. That's the thinking with this. So then we'll look at uh, kind of some pull systems, how we can actually use this. And this is the method that we can kind of coordinate a production down the line. We use that, we use a pull system for those. And again, the trigger for that is the removal of completed product. When the product is removed, that's the signal to produce. And so what happens when we can implement a pull system now is those sequence schedules we put in at the start to kind of establish some stability, those schedules now become just a reference not the production authorization. The pull system takes over as managing the shop floor. And the end result is, more than a schedule, the pull system in real time is responsive to changing customer demand. And that's how we can produce what they want, when they want it, and in the quantity they need it, more effectively than with just schedules. And so, you know, here's the, a simple little review of that again. Um, normal condition with two units, no need to produce. One of the units is removed now we can start producing to replace that right that's how that that method of communication removing a product as a method of communication triggers and controls production uh, then moving on to our andon system so at its core the andon system is really a way for the operator to stop and notify a supervisor when there's an abnormality at that point of occurrence it's also a status notification you know is the process running is there abnormality there what's going on uh, there are two kinds of andons, the human andons, you know, flag light, could be an email, text message, whatever, and the machine andons, um, a light, the machine shuts down, locks out, you know, whatever. But that's kind of how these andons get put into place. Uh, it's just some sort of, of simple notification. And then finally moving on to Kanban, and this is um, a little bit more complicated compared to some of the other tools because uh, there's a few more rules, um, but on the upside there's a lot more flexibility in how to actually apply it. As with everything else, there's key thinking that has to be incorporated, but the details, uh, everyone is free to tailor to fit their own needs. So there's three critical rules of uh, Kanban that we'll run through in a little bit more detail um, coming up, but the first one just in general. Uh, is that the tags have to be turned in before the first part is used. Uh, we also want to make sure that no process exceeds the lead time and we also want to make sure that no process ships defects or short ships parts. Those are kind of a quick summary of those three rules. Uh, then we'll take a look at cards and tags, the information on them. Um, and then the example we've got here uses um, some work center racks as, um, as kind of intermediate stores. Gives an example of how that works and then we'll wrap it up with a quick summary. So. The, uh, the first rule of Kanban, all, turn, all tags have to be turned in when the bin is in the front location before the tag is removed. Uh, and I'm not going to read through everything here. This is in the handout for everyone to have as a reference. But essentially why we do this is that if you turn in the, if you turn in the tag to get more parts after you've used all the parts, in order to not run out at any point during production, you have to keep a greater number, greater amount of inventory present than if you tag, turn the tag in on the front end. And it may sound uh, a little bit non-intuitive, but it's pretty straightforward when you kind of think about it. So for instance, if you turn the tag in before you start using the parts, now, because the tag is in, 
while you're using those parts, the other areas of production have time to work on replenishing them. So as you're using them, they're working on replenishing them. If you turn the tag in after you've used them all, now that buffer, that cushion is gone. And so whatever inventory is behind that bin now has to be greater because there's, it's going to take longer to get the replenishment in because you gave them the signal to replenish at a much later time. That's really why we want to turn the tag in up front. It helps us keep inventory low. Uh, the second rule, no process can exceed the given lead time. The real reason for that is that the quantities that we produce for our Kanban are based on our usage and our lead time to produce. And it's pretty simple. If it takes longer to produce it than we plan for, parts aren't going to arrive on time. We're going to have material shortages. We're going to shut production down. So it's important to be able to see how things are progressing uh, in terms of Kanban replenishment. And it's important to have good responsive problem solving uh, to be able to prevent that uh, lead time from exceeding our expectation. Uh, then the third rule, kind of in the same vein, uh, we don't want to ship defects or short ship downstream processes with our Kanban. For the simple, for the simple sake of uh, where we just stated that Kanban is a function of lead time and usage, and if we exceed our lead time, we break the lead time part of that and the system will fail. If we short ship or ship defects that we can't use, then we, we don't satisfy the usage part of our expectation and the system fails from the other end. So we really want to make sure that if we if the expectation is we provide five of something, we always provide five, never four, never three. So we'll move on and take a look at what the tags are. And they can take many shapes and forms as we've seen before. Um, and kind of the nice thing about it is that different styles can be used to communicate different information. So shape, color, area, you know, what's on them uh, can be used to control all sorts of things and remain visual so that we can tell what we're looking at. But um, just as we've discussed before, you know, all the Kanban tags with the other tools, Kanban's no, no exception, there's kind of some core information that has to be represented. In this case, the four things, got to say what to produce, what that quantity is, who's going to produce it, what that, what that production sequence is, and then where it goes when it's done. That has to be there. And so to just take a look at a quick sample tag, you know, the first thing we see is you know, what it is, the quantity to produce. Um, and then this is tailored with a little bit more information um, because just as a good example of how you can customize these. So in this application, uh, there's a, a checkbox to see if it needs some additional documentation to complete the order. Uh, this one says where the card goes to start production, right? Where to start that production chain. Then you've also got some additional information for the people or the team members that are producing it. You know, what material they need to use, what their operation quantity is, uh, what programs their equipment needs to run to make this, right? You can put as much or as little on here as you need. Then you've got, um, just as important as anything, where the parts go when they're done. Again, another tick box. Are there other parts that need to get mixed with this and turned into a kit? Yes or no? And then you've also got uh, a routing for where these parts go as they start to get assembled and put together, ending up with the final finished goods location. Where they go when they're done. Where do they go to the person that needs them? Right. So that's kind of the information. There's core information and then whatever else information is useful based off the business need. Um, in this case, we'll kind of look at this example of setting up these work center racks, which kind of work as material stores. Not quite, because you're not maintaining a fixed level of inventory, but for a B-type pull system, high volume uh, or high variety, low volume, it kind of works as a as a uh, as a de facto store. And so you've got a way for uh, incoming product that needs to be processed to come, and outgoing process that's being shipped somewhere else to go. <coughs> And as we've seen, this uh, blue and yellow is how they're marked. To make it visual, visible management, status at a glance. That's always a focus. And then in this case, there are some document pouches here just for um, the paperwork, the cards that went with all these jobs just to keep it organized. Color-coded uh, to keep it visual as well. And just like with the, with the pull system that we've talked about, um, every work process area needs material racks and needs stores. So it's important that we implement this um, in all the places it needs to be implemented to work, otherwise the system will break. And so then this is just a quick example of, of how the process of Kanban works through a pull system. So you have a team member in his work center and he's working or he or she is working and they, they use a part so they need to get that part replenished. So they turn in their tag um, at the Kanban drop-off point. 
Then material handling, uh, or whoever, in this case material handling, picks up that tag, processes the order, and then triggers production by taking the tag to where it needs to go to start production. Then the first uh, production is started on it. It moves in to the, uh, the downstream uh, material rack uh, with the tag and all the information to, for what needs to be done next. Then that process does their work. They take it from their material rack. They finish what needs to be done. They put it in their outgoing store rack. Uh, then it gets transferred from there to uh, the next downstream process. Same thing, so it's kind of iterative. So it comes into incoming, it gets processed, goes into outgoing, transferred to the next step. And then when it's done, the finished goods come all the way back to where the destination was, and they're put there. Um, and then when the team member needs to use those parts again, they're right in his material store, and you can take them to the workstation and start working. So it's kind of a big circle. So it starts with the team member uh, that signals I need replenishment and then that tag tells everyone else in the entire production chain what to do and when in order to get that replenishment to that team member exactly when they need it that's how Kanban works and so just in quick summary um, just some pitfalls so the Kanban system will, will break down and there'll be part shortages if we break any of those three rules if we don't turn the tags in in time if we exceed our lead time to make it or if we start shipping defects or short shipping also if the information on the tag isn't followed and parts go to the wrong place or the wrong parts get made um, another big thing is that Kanban isn't static we don't do it once and leave it our quantities and usages are always changing in response to customer demand so Kanban is, is a system that has to be maintained just like any other equipment and if we don't update it, if we don't maintain it then our system is going to break because it's no longer designed to meet what our current condition needs are and then the last part there, if, if the team members aren't actually retrieving their finished goods and, and using their stores properly then we're going to have a, a system failure and then the last kind of key point out of this is that for team members, for management, because uh, it's a pull system and the Kanban is the communication, any deviation from this has to be communicated through an andon so it can get addressed and resolved with a sense of urgency. Otherwise, it's going to snowball down the chain and cause part shortage and, and, and uh, other issues like that um, down the line that may be more difficult to fix at that point when they occur. So that's why it's important that we have an andon system in place. The last thing we'll take a look at, um, just kind of as a reminder again, this idea of continuous improvement. And in terms of developing our tools and using our tools, it's important to remember that, that no process is ever perfect, that we're going to have problems with anything we do, that these breakdowns are going to occur. But by implementing these tools and leveling up our tools and continuously working on our tools, we can create better communication that helps support creating a sense of urgency to address these things in real time. And that's really how we start to get more efficient is through being nimble and responsive. And that ties back to you know our lean problem solving initiatives. You know the real focus of that, a large part of that focus, is to close the gap that exists between our actual condition, where we are now, and where we'd like to be ideally. Right? That's what we're working for, that's what we're working towards with problem solving. And that ties into this idea of continuous improvement, right? because through Kaizen activity and developing our human resource we really want to continuously strive to realize what our production potential is, that ideal condition for our production potential. Kaizen is that mechanism to help us bridge that gap. And that's the key point for this. Through developing our people, through human development, through you know, utilizing Kaizen to help support that, we're able to really strive continuously to realize our production potential that's kind of the key thing out of these tools. I, I put this in here at the end because we've shown some templates, we've talked about these things in the abstract, but really the best way to do it is, is to go try and put these in place, see how they work, and then we constantly want to tweak them and fix the things that aren't working based off team member feedback to continuously improve our tools, to continuously improve our processes, to continuously improve our organization, and to continuously work on shrinking that gap between what we can do and what we should be doing. That's the key takeaway from that. And so, you know, as with anything else, uh, please direct any questions you may have to, uh, to the website through online submission. Thanks. Bye.